Well, guys, thanks uh, for sticking around this afternoon. I know it's, uh, it's been a big weekend. There's lots going on, a lot of adrenaline flow. Lisa, awesome talk. Um, <laughs> you know, kind of uh, batting clean up here. There's, there's Shane as well who's going to be speaking uh, soon. I actually was a little worried as I'm listening to all these wonderful talks because I'm like, man, you're stealing all my material. <laughs> so I, we, all, we all share these same experiences. And I wasn't trying to be rude or facetious asking you if you're masochistic out there. I ask myself that question a lot because people text, well, Facebook me a lot of messages like, do you just love pain and suffering, getting out there and doing what you do? Because as I'm going to show you with my talk today, boundless isn't only about success. I don't cherry pick events that I know I'm going to do great in. I like to pick events that, in some cases, I've never tried before. And I'm going to get uh, bent over daddy's knee and take a hard spanking. Um, so maybe that does make me slightly masochistic. Anyways, um, thanks again to, uh, to the team for bringing me out. Uh, it's really been an enjoyable weekend for me and uh, inspiring. There was yesterday one of the questions, what inspires you? The audience, other speakers, enthusiasm, passion inspires me. So plenty of that this weekend. It's been awesome. All right, so my name is Simon Donato. Um, coming in all the way from Canada. I live in a small town called Canmore. Uh, it's out west of uh, Calgary. And the title of my talk, which I don't remember picking, but that's okay, I forget a lot of things. <laughs> Unbelievable Tales and the Science of Boundless <laughs> Adventure. So your choice whether you choose to believe any of this stuff by the end of it. All right, I'm a big fan of observation. Okay, I live my life by observation, um, eyes wide open most of the time. Although I think I did have meeting narcolepsy when I used to work for uh, Exxon Mobil. That's probably related to something different. So I freaking love this little meme here. Epic parenting fail. Letting your kid wear a red vest. Yeah, I mean, sure. But maybe holding the hatchet is the epic parenting fail here. And, you know, you just take a quick look at it. You read the caption. Okay, the kid's got a red vest. You might not even notice the hatchet that he's grabbing onto or that dad's giving him or perhaps taking away. I mean, Ron, you showed the, the FedEx logo earlier. It's like, take another look at the picture, right? And uh, see what's in there. So, I don't know. This is... This just cracks me up. I keep this on my desktop for a laugh from time to time. But it's really, it's a theme for me with, with everything from boundless to stoked oats to adventure science. Sure, I'm chasing my passion, but along the way, I've got to make a living. And I tend to sit back and observe, see what's going on. Stoked oats came about because I observe trends. So I'll get more into that. But first of all, I want everybody to stand up for a sec. Fit audience. You guys should be able to handle this. Do a spin. Take a look around the room. Check out your neighbor. Maybe there's some people you haven't seen so far. Maybe you know everybody. That's okay. Now, you guys can have a seat. And I had a really um, influential mentor of mine named Jeff McGinnis give me my epiphany moment, which has launched me on this boundless path of mine. It happened in 2008. I was over at his house. I had actually raced uh, Eco Challenge in New Zealand and Fiji with Jeff and uh, a few others. Um, and, you know, I just, I wanted to be like Jeff. I'm um, a few years behind him, so he was always doing really cool stuff that I could follow. And we're having this conversation, we're sharing some Heineken's, and I'm nearly done my PhD. And I'm talking about what's next for me. I've got a choice to make. I've been accepted into the fire department uh, for the city of Toronto. Wicked job, awesome lifestyle, 24-hour shifts. I have a buddy in there uh, who basically works eight days a month. Gets paid a full month's salary. That doesn't sound like too bad a gig. However, I've been in school since I started kindergarten. It was a lot of years. I was coming out the other end as a geologist. I had a job offer with Imperial Oil, ExxonMobil. And uh, they were offering me a lot of money. So here I am, reasonably poor grad student, um, getting offered a chance to use what I've learned in school, which intrigues me and pay me well to give me opportunities to do other things that I like. Or take a lifestyle job with a fire department, build up the salary to something comfortable over a few years, but have all this free time. Well, I'm having this discussion with Jeff 
And he goes, Simon, look, man, we're all unique in our own ways, okay? So the reason I had you all stand up is because if you take a look around the room, I mean, we're all the same species. None of us look the same. Even identical twins don't look the same, and they're definitely not the same. So, first of all, from our exteriors, we're already unique, let alone once you get past the skin. I mean, what's going on inside all of us, it's a black box, and no box is the same. And that's what I love about interacting with everybody, because we're, we're all unique. And I think it's important to remember that, because we can fall into the trap of routine and thinking that we lead an average life. What is average? I don't believe in something like a human being average. Okay, statistically, if you look at one variable, you can pull some averages out. Average test scores, average age for whatever you're looking at. Looking at single variables. If you expand it in, in the realm of humanity, try and get inside somebody's brain. We're not average, we're all unique, we're all special, and again, harken back to this whole passion idea, which, which Lisa was mentioning, we all have different interests, different passions. And for me, that's really what makes us unique. We have some unique way to give back. And Jeff, it was an epiphany. When he mentioned that, I was like, whoa, I do have something unique to offer. I love adventure racing, being an adventure athlete. I love science. Adventure Science was born. Adventure Science is a volunteer-based organization that I run founded in 2008, where I take athletes like us and pair them with field-based academics. We go out and take on these research projects that regular researchers couldn't afford to do, don't have the physical skill or stamina or ability to get out and do it. And the athletes, the skilled the professionals, who are paying their own way, by the way, um, they're the eyes and ears. The researchers teach them. Athletes are eyes and ears. So that was a big epiphany for me. I realized that, yeah, there is something unique about me. And my unique skill at the time was adventure science. So this little photo here is actually from my most recent project, which was uh, in Canada. This is on Lake Huron, a part of it we call Georgian Bay. And we did a uh, stand-up paddleboard tour of the region. Went after a bunch of uh, known shallow wrecks. These wrecks were... Uh, well, the wrecks occurred in the late 1800s. Um, at this time, there was still a lot of wooden shipbuilding. There was a massive growth of uh, cities in North America. And they logged the heck out of the region. So they needed the timber that was there. Because of that heavy, uh, heavy um, lake-going uh, trade and bad weather, a lot of shallow shoals, a lot of wrecks. Very cool little project. And... You know, this is where adventure science has taken me. So, I've got a little line up there. Where we are is the result of where we've been. My path is different from your path and yours and yours. And, you know, it's, it's up to us to step back, observe, and then make something out of that path. So, you know, Jeff and I had that conversation when I was, uh, it was 2006. So, my God, I would have been let's say 29 years old. Um, so I've been around a little bit, I've done a few things, but the, the basis of my pyramid of life, obviously, started in my childhood. Um, I had parents that got me outside. I mean, why do I love nature? I don't know. As an anthropology student, we spent a lot of time talking about nature versus nurture. Is it inherent, intrinsic, that some of us just love to run around? Am I more monkey than uh, you, for example? Do I like swinging from trees because I'm less evolved? Or is it something that was nurtured in me? Is it because my parents took me outside, took me to Lake Louise when I was, you know, uh, must have been six, seven years old there, uh, took me skiing with them. They'd bundle me up, put me in the back of the sled, and cross-country ski um, through the frigid plains of Winnipeg. Um, and I would sleep soundly, but, you know, maybe osmosis worked. As I grew up, opportunities to learn skiing. And, you know, here I'm probably 16, 18 years old, and cliff jumping. It's just one thing led to another, but the common theme for me 
was that I loved spending time outdoors. I remember when I was eight years old, my dad said to me, hey son, because uh, he always calls me son, he's very formal. Uh, hey son, um, your birthday's coming up and um, you know, your mother and I would like to buy you an instrument. So what's your favorite instrument to play? I mean, I'm eight years old, I don't really care about instruments or music. I'm listening to Rafi. Um, I, <laughs> guitar, that sounds cool. So of course on my birthday I get a guitar. <laughs> then the expectation is that I learn to play the guitar. So my parents uh, asked me to practice 15 minutes a day. Okay. Try and remember back to being eight years old. Fifteen minutes? Friggin' lifetime. All right? Like, I'd be strumming away for five minutes, and then, like, looking outside, my friends are running around through the fields, and I backed onto a forest. It was over 100 acres. It was amazing. Um, and I'm like, oh, I gotta get outside with them. Oh, they're having a rock fight now. Oh, I'm playing this stupid guitar. But needless to say, I never became a very good guitar player. But I did become reasonably uh, proficient at living life in an exciting way outdoors. So, you know, that, that seed was planted early. And, you know, with me, I think it was definitely a nurture effect. Um, my parents made choices to bring me up in a uh, more or less wild setting. Um, I was able to get outdoors. As long as my mom could see me from the kitchen window, you know, that was, that was fair game. I could go as far as she could see me, and she has a great booming voice. So if I got out of view, I would hear her, and then I could come back. But then I started following my passions and making tough, reasonably tough decisions uh, at the time to uh, pursue different academic avenues. So I started out, I wanted to get into biology. I thought that was awesome. First year, I got smoked, grades were okay. Um, decided, well, you know, maybe biology is not for me. But I did fall in love with anthropology, really like the archaeology side. So I took that, majored in anthropology, archaeology minored in ecology and evolution. It was a little branch of uh, the bio program at Western. From there, uh, my dad wanted me to be a lawyer. Okay, we need a lawyer in the family. <laughs> I'm like, all right, well, I'll give it a shot. Showed up, wrote the LSAT, literally scored you know, the median score. A B plus average plus the median wasn't good enough to get me into law schools I'd applied for, so had to rethink it. And you know, at the time, it's a, it's a tough pill to swallow, right? Because like, oh God, maybe I'm not so smart. But best thing that ever happened, because at that point, I rediscovered paleontology. As a kid, I freaking loved fossils. And, you know, it's all I wanted to, to read about and talk about and hunt down with my family. Got away from me in school, came back to it, and did a master's in paleontology, and then, you know, was, was all in again. PhD in geology. At the same time, I'd fallen into adventure racing. So I was a kid that loved team sports. Played baseball, played football. Uh, I did some karate on the side, alpine ski racing in the winter. Um, you know, loved all team sports, hated running. Running cross country was mandatory when uh, I was in my elementary school. So I'm going to say probably grades six to eight, we had to run. Teachers would lead us out on these routes, but the routes were close to my home, and I knew shortcuts, and I would take them. <laughs> I'd drift to the back of the pack, the last <laughs> teacher would pass me, um, and then I would cut off through a yard and go eat crab apples or something until they looped around and then merge back in with the herd and uh, nobody's, nobody's the wiser. So it just wasn't fun for me. I didn't enjoy it. I'm a guy who just, I have to do things that I enjoy, otherwise interest is out the window. So I got into the endurance world through mountain biking. Mountain biking led me to adventure racing and eventually the Eco Challenge, which was like my Olympics. I hit my Olympics and I was just supercharged. I thought, my God, there's such an amazing world out there. I want to be a writer, uh, books and articles, and I want to host a TV show. I was 24 at the time. And Boundless didn't come around until I was about 35, 36 years old. I'd been doing a little bit of writing before that, but like, this stuff takes time. You cannot push your agenda on people. So definitely one of the greatest life lessons that I've learned is you've got to be patient when you're chasing your goals. You've got to be focused, keep the drive, and keep moving in the direction. But you only know the direction when you look backwards. And if you haven't seen Steve Jobs' Stanford Address, I mean, I think it's one of the greatest speeches online. It is just epic, connecting the dots backwards. You know, he talks about getting canned from Apple, a company that he founded. 
brings somebody in that he trusts, they fall out, boom, board sides with the other person and Steve Jobs is done. Best thing that ever happened because what did he found? Was it Pixar? I think it was Pixar. And again, brings out something that's revolutionary. So, you know, sometimes hitting the reset button definitely stings at the time, but um, it's a good thing to have. So, you know, I go through school, I'm adventuring, I'm living the life of an academic, take the job as a geologist, now I'm making some money, and I can fund these adventure science projects, which they're always self-funded. I don't want to raise money and bring people along because they think it's a cool experience and not have them pull their weight. I only want people who want to be there to spend time with because it's always a much better experience for everybody. It's just richer for everybody. So how did Boundless start? Because a lot of people want to know how they can start their own television show. Basically, uh, I took $15,000 and hired a small film crew and editorial team to shoot a little documentary. It's called Go Death Racer. Uh, it's available online. There's a trailer if you want to see it. But again, being an observer, um, I, like to, I like to sit back and watch trends in sports. I got into adventure racing at the ground floor. Lisa, you started in 95 with the Eco Challenge out in Utah. That was the true ground floor. The ground swell started in 97, 98, 99. That's when things really took off and unfortunately slowed down after 2002. But, you know, I noticed that I got in early enough that it was still exciting. It was the heyday. Ultra running. Ultra running's been around for a very long time. I mean, check into the history of Western states. It's been around for, what, 40 years now? So, as a running race. Um, but it, as adventure racing died, something filled the void. And, well, numerous sports filled the void, but ultra running was one of them. And it experienced a massive resurgence. And again, I caught it on a little bit of the leading edge in terms of the information side of it. I signed up for my first race, 125 kilometer race, called uh, the Canadian Death Race. It's up northern Alberta, it's a mountain running race. And I'm looking online, I cannot find any information about this race. They've literally posted an old brochure as to, you know, here's how you can sign up and blah, blah, blah. But nothing about here's how many aid stations we have. This is what's at the aid stations. Here's how you should prepare. I'm like, and I didn't know of you at the time. Had I, I would have asked people, but I didn't know. So I'm like, all right, this is an experiment for me. I turned it into an adventure science project where I actually um, created a, a strength training program because I know that running long distance can lead to injuries. So I, I took 12 athletes. I split them down the middle. It's not a huge sample size, but it's what I could afford. And six of them had my core training program developed by an expert. Six did not. And... That was the focus with the documentary as an aside following four of us to see how badly we exploded. So, you know, it's, again, it's just following passions, answering questions, being curious. That 25-minute documentary went to a friend of mine from university. He's an editor based in Toronto. Well, he's in L.A. now, but he was in Toronto at the time, Josh Eady. And he's the co-creator of Boundless. He edited Go Death Racer. He's like, Simon, there was something awesome here. I just love the dynamic between you and your buddy Turbo. And ultra running is so cool. He'd never heard of it. He's a basketball guy. He loves basketball. He's a great athlete, but just never heard of ultra running. He's like, we've got to do something with this. All right, well, I can write. He can edit. Created a little sizzle reel that was two minutes long or so. I wrote the pitch, and uh, within a week, we had an offer from a broadcaster in uh, Toronto, which, again, uh, Vinny and I were talking earlier, and it's, it's really rare for that to happen. We definitely got lucky with it, um, however you define luck, but... Right place, right time, right people. So we, uh, we went for it. And that was um, April 2012. I quit my job at ExxonMobil August 3rd. I had just come back from shooting our first episode. Literally landed, got into my car, drove to work. Happened to bump into my manager, Nancy, in the elevator. And I uh, said, hey, Nancy, I'm quitting today. It's like, all right, get your letter of resignation in by 2 o'clock and we'll go out for team beers. So that's how it went down. It was pretty good. And as a geologist, you're privy to sensitive information, so you don't have to give that two-week notice. It's uh, the day you, you say, I'm done, you're done. So that's, that's how Boundless got started. Now, the next couple slides, I'm going to show you a few Boundless clips. I'm going to talk about two other big themes in my life that I spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, fear, personal limits. And... <laughs> the most cliche quote in the world, but it is so damn true. There's nothing to fear but fear itself. 
Well, I was reminded of that one this past summer. So that's a little photo from the local newspaper of myself and uh, my buddy Ryan Atkins. Uh, if Atkins sounds familiar to you, it's because he's one of the best obstacle course racers in the world right now. The kid's a total beast, really, really nice guy. And uh, his sister-in-law, or soon-to-be sister-in-law, lives in Canmore. She's an ex-Olympic uh, uh, national team cross-country skier, super fit. So he and his fiance Lindsay, come out and, and train in the mountains. He comes out and says, Simon, I want to do the Rundle Traverse. So we've got the World of Ultra Running, and then a little branch of that is something called Fastest Known Times. Um, people go out to break records that aren't necessarily races. Some see it a little, as a little more of the, the purest uh, approach to ultra running. Of course, as soon as you put a clock on it, I think it changes things. But, um, you know, it's, it's for the joy. It's for the sense of adventure and exploration, which I still really love. The Rundle Traverse is this gnarly ridge that runs between the town of Canmore, where I live, and the town of Banff. Who knows about Banff? Banff National Park, gorgeous place. If you ever get the chance to visit, make sure you spend some time there. It's a big limestone ridge, and uh, it's got 11 summits on it. Some are bumps, some are pretty legit that require climbing skills. And I'm a proficient climber and mountaineer, but I'm certainly not the best out there. And Atkins wants to go for this record. Okay, Ryan. Um, what do you say we start at noon? We'll go out and do four or five hour recon. Um, I've got to do some work this morning. So this is, uh, I think we banged it off in late July, early August. So we're out there doing the uh, recon, um, spent about three hours pushing forward and we climbed to peak seven. Peak seven is a commitment because it's a number of ledges, six to 10 feet, and the climbing is not tough, okay? Um, good handholds, good footholds, but you've gotta be a little bit bold and you've gotta to commit to your moves. Well, we get up seven and we're like, man, we are making awesome time. The record's sitting at 13 hours and change, and we are well under that right now. It's pretty much a bluebird day. There's hardly any wind. It's warm, and we've got plenty of food, reasonable amount of water, and we've got overnight bivvies should we need them. I mean, it's just emergency gear for being in the mountains, right? Um, so we make the decision. We're going to go for it. We're going to go for the FKT now. So we get off number seven, make our way along to number 11. Now... Anybody familiar with the name Adam Campbell? Okay. Guy's another beast. He looks like a little pixie elf, but he's, he's one of Canada's greatest runners, greatest ultra runners. He came third the last two years in the Hard Rock 100, which it's a tough race. Yeah. Maybe the toughest. Um, in June, he had tried this route. He got somewhere in here and was climbing up when a, a boulder or a chunk of rock the size of him broke away. Scared the hell out of him. He was soloing. He had already lost his phone. It had fallen out of his pack. He was out of water at that point. So he down climbed, which is not easy, down to the gully, through the trees, and then bushwhacked down to a trail. Uh, and it taking him 17 hours. At that end of the 17 hours, for probably the previous 45 minutes, myself and another good friend, Phil Villeneuve, we were on the phone with the parks people, um, his roommates, anybody who knew him, have you heard from Adam? We were getting very, very worried. So 17 hours out there, we finally, he finally called in and said, guys, you know, here's what happened. You'll never believe it. But, uh, and he went without climbing gear. No ropes and nothing to, uh, to rappel off because there are anchors because normally people do this in a three-day mountaineering route. So, you know, I've got that in my head that this rock is rotten. It sucks. And it almost killed Adam a couple months earlier. But we go for it. So it's about 300 meters, which we'll just call 1,000 feet. We've come down off peak 10, which is a couple hundred meter descent, and there's some legitimate serious scrambling and climbing in there. I'm already sweating bullets. We cross this. Then we start moving up slabs. So the Rockies are known for the, for the slabs that they have. So, you know, reasonably steep angle. But again, it's rotten rock. Uh, it tends to slide. And there's a bunch of loose junk on top of it. So think about ball bearings on a hard surface. Okay, it's, it's very sketchy. You cannot grab a slab of rotten rock like this and hold your weight against it, okay? You have to plant and use friction to move up this like an animal, like your bear crawl or a panther moving along. Slow, steady, sure. 
that was incredibly scary. And that wasn't the worst part. And mind you, we've got hiking boots and backpacks on, okay? No, no climbing gear at all. Major mistake. Once we get up here, we start punching up ridges. A little more slab, a few ridges and ledges to go. And we're doing it. I'm scared as hell, but we're doing it. We get to this point. I'm going to say we've got less than 50 meters to get to the true summit. And we hit the real crux. There's a 50-foot wall. It's a big buttress ahead of us. And I'm looking at it like, how the hell am I going to get up this thing? So we spent some time exploring for any kind of weakness. Are there some cracks that we can exploit? You know, do big hand jams and stuff. No chalk bag, nothing, and this is rotten rock. It's highly fractured. So, I mean, I'm 170, 175 pounds. You only test it at mm, 50 to 70%. You never test it at a full 100% until you go 100% and you've committed. So that's 70% test where you're like, eh, I think it's going to hold. There's still 30% in your head that's like, or it may not, and you'll die. So going up that final 50 feet was the scariest thing I've ever done in my life. And, you know, we're talking about psychic experiences and, and this moment where you feel the push or you see the light or something like that. I'm not going to say I was there, but just this intense sensation where you are so focused. I'm not thinking about paying rent. I'm not thinking about the next boundless event. I'm not thinking about anything except, do I have this hold? Where's my foot going? Where's my next hand going? Am I sweating too much? Is my hand too slippery? Do I need to dry it on my pants? You are so in the moment. It's very hard to describe unless you've been there. So, you know, fear in this case was something that I had to control. Ultimately, yeah, I could have bailed out and down climbed, but I didn't want to. Call it pride, call it ego. I don't know what it is. I like to think that I don't have an ego, but, um, you know, I really had a strong desire to get to the top of it. And ultimately, I did. But it's, it's that over coming the fear which is the biggest barrier because you throw me on a 5.7 in a climbing gym and blindfold me I'll probably shoot right up it without thinking twice but in a situation like that where the consequences are extremely real the fear starts to mount what's changed? nothing when we were running this morning I went out for a run with uh, Travis and Andy and we were just you know, shooting the breeze about what we'd done in our earlier days I used to teach mountain bike lessons and for the novice rider, when they come up to a big, big log, try and hop over it, they get freaked out, get off their bike, walk it over. One of the tools that I used was a visualization technique where I said, what would you do if it was a pile of dirt? Same shape, okay, steep-sided, but it was only dirt. I'd go for it. All right, then go for it. You know, it's the same situation, but the mind flips it around on you. So I want to show a little boundless clip here of... Uh, some of the uh, hairier moments that we've had um, where we've had to, again, deal with the fears. And, you know, fear of failure is uh, it's a big one for us because ultimately I get paid to make a TV show, okay? Nobody's forcing us to finish, which is beautiful. We, you know, we get to push as hard or as easy as we want, but, um, you know, it's, it's always there. So... First season, this is the first race we did. We went out and did this paddleboard race from the island of Molokai to the island of Oahu. It's uh, 33 miles, I believe, open ocean. I'd paddleboarded about five times before this. Um, <laughs> I thought, how bad could it be? Turbo was pretty much in the same boat. Well, here's how bad it could be. We're doing about 15 minute yeah, rotations. Right there, 
times get thrown in. It was warm, back up, thankfully. Thrown in, yeah. back up. It was just crazy. The Malika runs. Tropical paradise. Paris for this at all. I feel like Rocky in a fight, you know, just getting pummeled and pummeled and pummeled. Hopefully we, we have to come out in the end like Rocky did. It's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, dude. I've done some pretty hard things, too. So those swells were so big. When you're in the trough, hard, hard and the boat's in the other trough, this is a two-tiered two fishing boat. You couldn't see it. I was on the board, and Turbo's turn was coming up, and he wasn't coming out. I think I like flat ground <laughs> better than moving ocean. It's all Gatorade. <laughs> now, fortunately, there was uh, no style points in this one. Time only. just raw. My pecs and my chest started cramping, my triceps started cramping. There, turbo's out. I yell, what the, what the hell does that mean? What do you mean he's out? And they're like, he's seasick. He's puking everywhere. I just sunk two hours into the race, and now I've got to paddle this stupid board 24 miles across this channel all by myself. Yeah, so you want to talk about, uh, oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, our first episode ever, you get the job of a lifetime. Hey, here's a TV show for you. And I can't stand on the board. I'm already disqualified because you can only kneel on it for a minute max and <laughs> definitely surpass that. Um, just getting spanked out there and now my partner is seasick. So, you know, it just, it just goes to survival. But again, you, you just have to find a way to manage fear. And it's when you're in these situations, there's no other choice. I mean, well, there is a choice. I could paddle to the boat and say, sorry, guys, I'm done. But that's not the kind of person I am. And I don't think that's the kind of person that most of us are. If you can fight, you fight. And, you know, Christopher McDougall's talk yesterday um, about the resistance on the island of Crete. They had a choice. They could have rolled over. They didn't have to die by the German hand. But they chose to fight. And I think that's in all of us. Um, just put your hand up if you start getting bored with this stuff. I'm going to show a few more clips. Um, the water has never been kind to us. And, you know, here's a really poignant example of fear of failure for us because... Uh, we really came close to failing with this one and not getting an episode. Uh, it's called the Fish River Marathon. It's one of the largest paddle races in the, in the world. It's a downriver paddle race. And you're in these river kayaks. I'll be brief. I'd never paddled one before. I paddled lots of boats, never paddled this. Too tippy for Turbo and I. Uh, we spent a lot of time swimming. So I'm just going to show a couple of short clips here. Just, again, to show you, show you the struggle and... and the eventual outcome. And you just feel like you're, you're getting all nervous holding people up, and you're getting all nervous trying to get in there. There's only so much space to get in. Actually, getting pushed, and I'm actually starting to wonder. 
So I panic and I lose one paddle. But I yelled to Simon, I said, I lost the paddle. He sounded really disappointed, but you know, it was the paddle of my life, and I said, F the paddle. <laughs> Right, so the short version is the paddle floats, which we didn't know, came over double trouble and they sent a lifeguard in to uh, get it to us. So we now have both paddles again, These, so the guy swam across the river, we got back in the water and um, paddled to another uh, obstacle which we portaged around and we're getting out of the water here, or so we're getting back in the water. Um, I'm trying to coach Turbo a little bit because, you know, we both want to succeed on this thing and make it to the end of the day, which is about 40K. At this point, I don't know, we've maybe done 5K. A long way to go. <laughs> uh oh. Well, this was buffered. Yeah, that would do it. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Uh, well, I'm going to skip that one anyways. So, basically, um, we were out of our league and uh, we found that out very quickly. Uh, I got injured, I floating through that uh, turbid water, you can't see what you're up against and trying to hold on to a boat and a paddle. You know, when you're floating downstream, feet up to kick the rocks. Well, my feet were under me, I smoked it with my knee and our race was done, so we thought for the day. So, very, very tough pill to swallow again when you know, you're up against it and there's a lot riding on it, um, your pride, but also you've got this TV show and how are you going to produce an episode with five kilometers of paddling? So um, we, we managed to figure it out, but literally we pulled out that day. And uh, it was brutal. It was, it was tough. And, you know, we were fearing for our lives. It just it didn't make any sense. I didn't want to get it hurt any worse. Turbo was worried about drowning. And, you know, that fear has actually stayed with him until this day. Um, so I would mentioned talk about fear. Now I want to talk about limits. You know, boundless is all about breaking through our personal limits. Um, for those of us who have been doing it for a long time, you realize that the mind is extremely powerful and that the limits only exist up here. I mean, sure, there's some real limits that I'm not going to flap my wings and start to fly away right now, but pretty much anything we want to do, four laps of Death Valley, uh, of the Badwater course, more or less, we can do it. Okay, it takes time to get there, but really it's a retooling of what's going on in the brain. And, you know, adventure racing, big ultras have taught me that. But boundless in particular reinforces it because I liken boundless to hammering a nail into a piece of wood. Okay, we do 10 episodes a year. Typically that's 8 to 10 races. Sometimes we do double episodes. That's 8 to 10 strikes on the nail. And we're the nail. TV doesn't really care about the ideal training uh, plan or race schedule, all right? So Tara, who was here yesterday, pro triathlete, how many Ironmans are you going to race in a season? Three? Four? 
maybe a couple of halves, all perfectly planned out, tapers built in, everything else. First season, we did uh, 1,200 kilometers of racing in four and a half months, all human powered. Um, I'd race in Kenya, 75K running race, a week before. So Saturday, I'm racing in Kenya. The following Saturday, I'm in South Africa to get my ass kicked on the Fish River. The following Saturday, I'm in Utah racing a, a mountain bike race just outside of uh, St. George. So it's like recovery is almost non-existent sometimes. So you've got to fight these battles in your mind because you know your body is just getting beaten down. So that's what I'm saying about your limits get reinforced by the experience. I'm going to show, uh, I think I've got one more boundless clip here. I'm going to tell a story about adventure science. So this past year, we went to, uh, it was in October 2014, we went to Madagascar, okay? Nothing like the cartoon. Um, it, is, it is off the grid. The people are extremely poor. Um, little educational opportunities. Minimal health care. Minimal communication, okay? You've got these... Uh, rural communities that are just like they are disconnected unless somebody's walking to the next one nobody knows what's going on so we picked this really remote park to go to it's called the Singi de Bamarahara and it basically translates to Singi translates to place you can't walk barefoot it's got this incredible limestone karst formation all right so limestone calcium carbonate think about your bicarbonate Alka-Seltzer whatever you throw it in water it dissolves when you get rainwater or groundwater moving through limestone, it does the same thing. It dissolves it. Here, for whatever reason, it dissolves it into like pitchfork-style spikes. It's a lot like a glacier. You've got these massive crevasses bisecting and cutting through, creating this incredible labyrinth that's two to five stories deep. On the top of it, you've got the spikes and ridges that are knife sharp. I mean, it's a brutal place to go. So nobody goes there which is why we go there, or went there. The other cool thing about it, and the sad, tragic thing about Madagascar, is there's very little forest left. I mean, we're talking 10 to 15% of country has forest cover. Reason being, they raise cattle, which is wealth there. The more cattle you have, the wealthier you are as a person, and well, as a man, really. Um, and the way they clear land is by tossing a match. So. They walk through an area that, so you're grazing over here, and they'll walk by, toss a match, burn it, so that you get fresh shoots coming up. But, you know, they keep on walking, and they come back a week or two later, and it's like, oh, geez, I guess I burned a few hectares of uh, this temperate forest as well. So, you know, it, it, it's really sad. The reason the singi still exists is because it's in this fortress of rock. You can't graze cattle there. So, thank God for that, it's preserved a forest which has preserved a population, a very large population and healthy population of lemurs, okay? Lemurs are endemic to Madagascar, means you won't find them anywhere else. I think those were in the cartoon, but anyways, um, we went there for a couple reasons. See if we can find some cool caves, see if we can find some dinosaur tracks, archaeological sites, and do a lemur survey with uh, a leading primatologist in the area. Had a huge team, it was over 20 people, uh, 12 of them came from North America, the rest were Malagasy for support. So there's no maps of the area. Okay, this Google Earth map is what I went off of. So I picked a place that I thought looked like a good base camp, it looked like there might have been a river going by. So I sent one guy out, Travis, who, the primatologist, he's already in country, I said, Travis, go check this area out. You get there a few days ahead, uh, I'm going to fly in with Jim, uh, Jim and Keith. When we get there, we're going to go out and do a little reconnaissance day to make sure the stuff that I had planned can actually be done. Because again, no maps, no clue. So we get out there, Jim, myself, and uh, Travis. Keith has set up base camp. We leave at 7 in the morning with the plan to be back at 4 to test out one of these routes. Because each day I wanted teens to go out and do these surveys, looking for caves, tracks, sites, whatever. And uh, we came back three days later in a Malagasy military helicopter. We'd been out of food and water for, well, we'd been out of water for uh, well over a day. we have been out of food for probably six, eight hours, and, you know, we'd been rationing peanuts at that point, and it's like, here's your four peanuts, enjoy. Thank you. So, you know, the days were getting over 40 degrees Celsius, so I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit, but you're probably pushing around 100. Super hot days, and, you know, 
we made some mistakes. Admittedly, we made some mistakes. We crossed the worst part of those pitchfork uh, rocks in the Singy. We didn't want to go back. I mean, it was, it was scary. So we thought, all right, let's see if we can find another way through because there's enough crevasses through this labyrinth that we, maybe, just maybe, one of them bisects it and we got an easy way back. Well, there weren't, and the forest was brutal. And, you know, we just kept pushing on and pushing on like an adventure racer would because we knew that on the other side of this thing, it's only about 10 miles wide, you've got grazing lands. And if we can just break through to the grasslands, then we can hightail it down to where I know there is a trail, which uh, this is a trail right here. This is where the military picked us up. But we didn't know we were there. Well, we knew we were somewhere in here. We didn't know we'd almost broken free. It's very, very hilly. And we thought we'd be able to find water because there was so much water around our camp. But what we also didn't realize is as we went uphill, because it's all an uphill climb to this plateau, well, limestone's porous, which I know and I should have realized. So the water goes down and then out. It doesn't sit on the surface. So we were literally licking dew off leaves. We were pulling water out of uh, tree wells, which is basically where a tree branch dies, falls off, and it leaves a little depression on the uh, trunk. And, you know, we're slurping water out of that. We find a cattle wallow, which nastiest water I've ever drank in my life. We had to siphon out tadpoles and poop and all the rest of that junk. But it was, it was nasty, and we're drinking that. Three chlorine tablets per liter. As soon as it hits Jim's lips, vomit. It's actually pretty hilarious, but not a good survival situation. So, you know, like we, we were at our limit there. Um, the conversation I most remember was we'd already made the call in uh, for rescue and get Keith working on it. He's our logistics man, he's a search and rescue guy, he knows the drill. And we're not getting anywhere. We've all signed up for Global Rescue, which is this international organization that's supposed to pluck you out of there if you get in trouble. They can't help. Oh, there's no helicopters in Madagascar. Gee, go figure, okay. Um, and the military doesn't want to tag in yet. So that night, we have this really serious uh, conversation. We're down to our last drips of water. You know, there's maybe a few peanuts left. Batteries are failing in all our equipment, okay? Sat phones, cell phone, GPS. And we don't exactly know where we are. So Jim, uh, kind of the veteran adventure racer in the group, you'd probably know Jim Mandeli. Uh, Canadian legend. He's like, guys, do you want to go for it? If, we, if we're going to go for it, we have to move at night because the days are too hot, saps our energy, we've got to move when it's cool. And like, it's probably the most serious conversation I've ever had in my life because if we got it wrong and we went for it and got it wrong, nobody knows where we are. We don't know if we're going to find water because Google Earth doesn't have a magic water feature. And we literally have no opportunity to call for help after that. So we opted to stay. Thankfully, um, there was a political favor pulled. Our consulate contacted Madagascar's consulate, and the military did come out and get us. So we were damn lucky. Uh, we learned the lesson the hard way and went on to have a really successful expedition. This photo here, uh, Explorers Club flag, uh, that's part of the team inside the cave we found, which turned out to be the third largest in that national park. So really exciting stuff, but we almost didn't make it there, and we definitely came up against our own personal and mental limits that day in a non-racing capacity. So I want to throw up uh, this final video. It's buffered. It should be good to go. A lot of people ask me what my favorite Boundless episode is. It's very, very hard to pick because they're all beautiful places, beautiful races, great people. But this one, you know, it's... Right in the heart. Um, it's got a soft spot for me. Turbo's up against it. So we're on this race. It's called the Salzkammergut Gut Trophy. 220 kilometer long mountain bike race in the Austrian Alps. That's what they look like. That's what we ride up. The race course looks like a saw blade. Okay, just up and down all day long. And you got 16 hours to complete it. I've finished already. So um, my day is mostly done and we're waiting on Turbo to get in. I should also say that I'm 10 years younger than Turbo. And Turbos is always like, you wait till you get my age. I'm like, buddy, I'm not going to be doing this when I'm your age. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, maybe, but uh, I like to tell him that anyways. So here is the final finishing sequence. It's about five minutes long. So uh, if you have to have a bathroom break or something, go for it. I won't take offense. But for me, this is probably one of the most moving moments that we've had in Balmus because it's, it's totally real. Mm -hmm.
The mind is a wonderful thing. It is the strongest thing you have, and if you focus it right, you can accomplish anything. But this is a tough race. The climbs are so long, it's like mentally beating on you. I was getting choked up because I would just make the cutoffs at each age station. I don't know what's going to happen. So sorry, there's a 10 second commercial break here, but I, I really wanted to, to show that quick piece because you're in Turbo's brain at that point. I mean, he's reached his limit. He is totally up against it. He doesn't think he's going to make it anymore. And he's just riding scared, barely making the time cutoffs. Still a long way to go. I didn't get any updates on Turbo when I was on the race course. I know he's pretty chill when he's out there, but I knew that pressure had to be creeping in there. He had to be getting anxious. It's not about, do I have the energy in my legs to cross that finish line? This is about time now. That's for you, Vinny. Along this whole race course, just amazing views. It's just a beautiful country. When you're racing a race as tough as this, to be able to look at the scenery and take your mind off the pain and the suffering just helps so much. But I'm not going to finish this race. A few times I was hoping that I wouldn't make the time cut off at the next aid station so I could be pulled out of the race. There's so many times during these long races where you have these peaks and valleys. There's so many times where you come way down and you just don't want to be there. Starting to get cold out. This is what racing these long, arduous races does to you. But then, the only thing I watched, I was pushing the time, but I realized, I'm so close, I'm getting there, this is it. I don't know what happened at that point, but I just started going. I found that extra push. At that point, I didn't even want to look at my watch. I just wanted to finish the race. So I just carried on and just kept plugging away. He's about an hour out. Touch and go, though, because he's got to make the cutoff. It's 8.05 right now, so he's really got to put the pedal to the metal, give it full gas, and just do it. He might just crack 16 hours to get here before 9 o'clock, so I'll be waiting by the start line for him with a gluten-free beer or a glass of wine. Maybe Pinot Noir, I think he likes that. Two is gluten-free. How long did it take you? It's 14 and a half or so. Not fast enough to win. <laughs> This is the toughest race I've done in my entire life. The constant mental and physical battle to get through these hills is just so tough. Went to the finish line about 10 minutes before their cutoff. I'm waiting and we went from 10 minutes to five minutes. Two minutes, and still no turbo. I don't know where it came from, but this inner power just came out and my whole attitude changed. This is it. I'm finishing this race. Knowing that you're just making all the time cutoffs by the skin of your teeth. One minute left! If for whatever reason the wheels fall off, you're not going to rank. That would be very, very difficult to take.
off with such a difficult race was both a blessing and a curse. Oh, man. That was incredible, man. Wow! It just throws us right back into the heart of it. You relive all those emotions that you have. You deal with your demons. Now, I think we're better set up for harder challenges. That's a champ. Lewis Pinto. I race this long and that, it just gives me confidence for all the next races. But if I missed the deadline by a few minutes and they said, you don't count, you're not finished, I think I would have punched the guy out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, that's, awesome. that's what it's all about. And uh, yeah, sometimes you're the hammer, sometimes you're the nail. But uh, it's always worth it. You always take something away. So, you know, that's limits. He, he came up against it and uh, he pushed through. and. I was super proud of him for that. Um, again, back to the most recent project. That young lady wrapped in the sleeping bag there is standing in the back now. Hey, Chanel. Um, yeah, so this was um, the paddleboard event that we did, or the paddleboard uh, expedition, and uh, it was also super cool. And I just, I wanted to end with um, something that I like to think about, and it's activation energy. So. Who's taken uh, high school or university chemistry and rumors with activation energy? Just shout it out. What's activation energy? The energy required. You have to overcome before the reaction to the car. Boom. That's activation energy. So I like to take these concepts, because pretty much that's all I remember from chemistry class. I take these concepts and apply it to real life, if you will. And, you know, we were hearing about this yesterday. It's take the first step, right? The activation energy, which I still need it a lot of times because it's easy to stay at the computer and write that article, work on something, research the next uh, race I'm doing for Boundless, but I also have to train. And I've got to convince myself to get outside. So I like to think of activation energy as you getting hyped up to build your energy to a level that you're going to overcome any obstacles in your way. So you take that first step out the front door because once you get out that front door, chances are you're not turning around. So I think Tara said that. On her worst days, she would lock the door so she couldn't turn around. Uh, I know the code to my door, so that really wouldn't work. But, um, you know, it's just for me, it, it's a powerful um, maybe metaphor, if you will, um, pulling from science to life that, you know, we all need an extra spike sometimes just to get it done. So I'd like to leave you with that as activation energy and... Uh, that's the story of how I live a boundless life. Thanks, guys. Thank